right there. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Welcome to, I think maybe the last panel of the cruise. Hello. Certainly the last one today and the last one I'm on, so that's why it's important to me. Uh, I put this panel together, I will be honest, not because I, I had a specific point of view or specific questions to ask, but mostly we have a lot of cool and funny people who are cool and funny in varying ways. Uh, and I wanted to get them all on stage to just talk, sort of semi-related to the topic of being funny, but mostly I just want to sit on the stage with these cool people. So we have Sarah Marshall, Jamie Loftus, Josh Gondelman, and River Butcher. I'm going to start with some kind of cliche questions, and it's just sort of open to the group, whoever cares to answer. Uh, and I apologize for how basic this is. Um, when did you start being funny? Were you always a funny person when you were younger? Is it a thing you felt you learned? Were you drawn to it from a young age? Or what was your sort of inroad to being professionally, if not a comedian, you know, to have humor be an important part of the content that you create? I'll take it. Everyone seems to be looking at me. <laughs> Um, I feel like I, uh, my particular life experience as a kid, being an only child, and I lived in, uh, my mom and I lived with her parents, so I was living with older people. I was just surrounded by adults that I was trying to make laugh all the time. Um, and they also enjoyed, you know, like, old-timey comedy, you know? So I feel like I got a very early education in very simple rules of comedy and, like, what was funny, and I also just happened to grow up when stand-up was in the golden age in the 80s, and I watched a lot of it on VH1, and so then I would just repeat the jokes that I had heard. Uh, hopefully all, only the clean ones. But um, yeah, I just, I liked, I just always liked making people laugh. It was like a very, it's very fun. It's very fun. I don't know if you guys have tried it, but <laughs> see, <laughs> it's great. Making others laugh because you said something is like, it's, it's the best drugs on the planet, I think. I've, uh, I've made people cry, and it is in a uh, way less sustainable rush. <laughs> I, I try to avoid that one. You feel too powerful in a way that you do not like, um, if you're me. I, I always thought I was a funny person, even when I was a very little child, which is probably not accurate, but like the, old, the oldest video of me that I'm aware of is I'm like two and a half, and I'm reciting this very long, intri intricate joke that my father has taught me to my great aunt, and I get distracted by an aunt that walks by, <laughs> and my dad has to remind me to finish the joke. And if you've ever seen my act, you're like, wow, it's the same 35 years later. Um, I, if you're like socially not great, but you also need attention all the time, it's a necessary skill <laughs> to develop. I just, I, I don't know, I like grew up with, um, like uh, my whole family uh, was very close and my mom ran a daycare out of our house with all 10 of my cousins and so it was like, felt like a, an easy way to kind of cut through the noise and feel like I could feel like, well this is my turf because I say the fucked up stuff here. <laughs> um, and my dad, I liked, uh, I, I really um, looked up to my dad growing up, still do, he's great, and uh, yeah, like I, he was a socially guy and that was how he still is he's great uh, but yeah that was like the way that he was able to sort of place himself in a room was like to make a joke and that was like something that people loved about him so much I'm like I don't really figure out how to do that and then um, 20 years later I didn't <laughs> Um, and then, I mean, it's to me, it's been kind of a funny journey because 
I always, I was like the funny kid in school. It was a way to establish a role for yourself and it was hard to see other ways that you were of value. Um, but it was always so totally separate from my work because I was in academia and the one I started doing what you're talking about. It was not intended to be funny. It was just that was the way that it came out and kind of the only way to make it psychologically sustainable for me to talk about these incredibly depressing topics. Um, and it's so nice to fall ass backward into doing for a living the thing that you like to do anyway. It did not mean for it to happen, but it did. Same. Um, I wish I could talk more original, but I think mine is more of a potpourri uh, and yours has been added to the potpourri <laughs> container uh, of just, you know, a, a young, kind of awkward kid who really loved attention and was precocious and really liked impressing parents and, and older kids and who knows when you do that, something like Python and, and, and uh, send it live. And, yeah, just did a whale. Uh, <laughs> another one down. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I always my answer for more original, but it's kind of the same thing. It just sort of like loving to impress, finding a thing you know, that I was. I, I wanted to be funny for a much longer time than I was funny, I think. It's, it was definitely, I, I think to some extent it has to be a make, but it's very much a learning skill and a muscle. Uh, and, you know, let me know if anyone feels any differently. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a thing that you learn how to do it and not do, and, and the, the forms and the, uh, the pitfalls and whatnot uh, of doing it. Yeah. I, I, that's actually going to segue speaking of falling ass backwards into the thing you want to do. Uh, I was going to ask about how early into adulthood or, or going into life and then looking to find some sort of career or making some sort of living, Storm and I were part of an acapella, pick up, a pickup acapella group that some guy put together. We both did acapella in college and then as we graduated <laughs> separately. I know it was the other. It's every, it's every young boy's story. We were in an acapella group in college. We uh, did know each other in different, different colleges. We ended up in the same sort of pickup group. A small group from within that stuck together uh, when that exploded after a couple of uh, months. And we ended up becoming we were an acapella band called Da Vinci's Notebook. And it, it started out, it was, just, it was a cover band, like any other cover band, basically, where we would sing doo-wop songs and rock songs and whatever. And we started covering some comedy songs, whether it was Weird Al or some other groups like The Bobs, which is a, a very seminal a cappella uh, comedy group from the 80s. And those went over really well, and we found we really enjoyed doing them well, and Storm and I, just as both the precocious suburban boys that we were, thought, that, like, that seems like fun, I think maybe we can do this, and we started writing for that. And we started getting more appeal that way, and it became a part-time job and a second job. Eventually, we went full-time towards the end of 1999, and we've been professional fart joke tellers essentially since then. Uh, all of which is to say, leading to, you know, we, to very, in, in varying ways, everyone on this stage does the job of telling stories. And did you start by telling stories and then bring humor into it? Were you always funny and then realized that Rather than just you know not duck jokes or whatever, that the you know the storytelling aspect worked its way into your your comedy, or the comedy worked its way into your storytelling. Uh, I'm curious if you, you know, know what your path was or when you knew it. We're not. No, oh, that's a great question. Before we get to that question, I I just want to say that I'm imagining that the rift in the acapella group was that Storm wouldn't stop playing guitar. <laughs> And everyone was like, come on, man, you know the one rule. <laughs> and I was like, no, man, he's a rebel. I did it. <laughs> he's changing the game about the fella. You really glossed over a whole Christopher Guest movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, believe you me, it's its own separate panel. Um, I, oh. No, you, I, all I had was. Ah. Ah. Okay, this is where I don't have a Western uh, follow up. This is. Um, but I mean, I'll start by saying that I specifically. When I was in high school, I had some 
close friends and like you two had just been invented. And so you would like go on and you would start a Kids in the Hall sketch downloading and you would go and you would make a bowl of cereal and you would come back and it would be done. And I was like trying very hard to get my friends to like the Kids in the Hall, but they wouldn't, but they did like it when I reenacted the Kids in the Hall sketches for them. And I think being like, I worry about the kids today who aren't forced to be the TV or be the radio for their contemporaries. So I think that like that's always going to be a thing that people do because we love doing it. And um, I, I, there's something I also just I hope that we that other people kind of pitch in talking about something that I love but don't understand that well. It's just like the joy of watching someone on stage like we've seen Amy or Josh or River on the strip like telling a story and the audience being with the story and it's like you're watching this sort of symphonic form of like communication on the same page and as when things go well it's extremely exciting which like I don't, I don't understand it but I want to point it out as an amazing thing. Um, I, I think it was a kind of like a longer, I, I didn't grow up like with any aspirations growing up that it like wasn't an option and I was like suffering under the uh, false belief that all comedians are extroverts, which is like not true. Oh at all. God. Like we're all Have you met any of us? <laughs> I hadn't, I was said it. <laughs> I was like, Pee Wee Herman seems so confident. <laughs> I can never do that. And so even though I always like enjoyed comedy and I remember I think in high school the big show for me was important things with Dimitri Martin that was like always assumed like I could never do that. Um, but then when I got to college, I sort of started to try to experiment. I did the radio, which is like, okay, I don't need to be seen, but I can like try being heard a little bit and you know join a comedy group. But if you're you know joining a comedy group in college in the early 2010s, you're gonna be like Mrs. Wife. <laughs> So like little girlfriend, and so even when I started doing comedy, it was like kind of discouraging because you're still put in these like kind of stock roles by you know 18 year old mostly guys who don't know what to do with you because there's what not a ton of comedy where they're shown what you can do, and so it was like a couple years of discouragement, and I think it was when I got out of the school setting and started doing stand up by myself, including. Like, I like to tell Josh every time I see him, Josh was like one of the first people ever who was ever encouraging me to do more stand up like 10 years ago when I was like 20. And it like, it meant so much to me because I loved your work and it was like, oh, this does feel possible. So it was like, it took a couple of years of trial and error and encouragement. And uh, Josh, I'm going to Ross. I think if there's one thing that we should all take away from this panel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you. That's so kind, Jamie. Um, I, I think I, I always liked doing jokes. I always like telling jokes and writing jokes. I think when I was a kid, I wrote also. I was like always trying to write. I love joke books. I was incredibly annoying, and I still so am like to this day. Uh, but I think I went to college, and I was a, a short fiction major, and that was very intentional. And I was like, I'm going to write books. I'm going to be the kind of person that writes like, funny books. And I was alongside that, I started doing improv and sketch and stand up. And I was doing so much of that and like ignoring my thesis. And every time I would read in a workshop with my wonderful thesis advisor, Steve McCauley, I would like read and everything I would write would be like so goofy and dirty. And he would kind of gently be like, there's a lot of fun, but like that's not like a book. <laughs> like that's not writing really. <laughs> and I'd be like, okay, got it, got it, got it. And like every I did the same thing. I would do a poetry workshop, and they'd be like, that's jokes. And I'd be like, why can't poems be jokes? And then uh, by the time I graduated, I kind of like gave up doing the other stuff because I realized I just wanted to do like the stuff where I could fill it with jokes. And then fortunately. Uh, I've been able to make a career out of it. But I mean, I, when I left school, I didn't know, I had not thought about a job. All I knew was like, I want to do stand up at night and then I'll make a living question mark. Um, and I was like, maybe I'll just like work at a bank. That seems like what grown ups do. 
And uh, my mom, who ran a small uh, independent school, was like, you should just, well, you should just teach. Like, you, that was always my like summer job. So I did that for a long time, teaching and tutoring, while well, I was like granting that into comedy as a career, and not just like the thing I like doing. Mm -hmm. Me? Okay, great. Um, the I feel like the storytelling part of uh, comedy wasn't. Well, I remember the first thing I did that I was like, oh, I really want to do this. I was in. Um, oh, good job. I'll get it in a second. Um, I was in this thing called Odyssey of the Mind as a kid. <laughs> I figured like five people would cry about that. <laughs> What's up, Odyssey of the Mind kids? Um, and it's, I don't know, they still do that. They, I mean, honestly, this cruise is Odyssey of Mind. Because <laughs> it's like this awesome thing where you just like, you, you're a team of people, and they do like robots, they do science stuff, but they also do performance stuff. And I was in the performance thing, um, and uh, I was lucky to be the only guy in all girls' school. Hopefully, you get that joke. <laughs> So I actually had a, a wild track of, at an early age, not experiencing those things that I would later experience in improv groups, where everybody just picked the thing they wanted to do, and then we were like, great, you should do that. <laughs> like, nobody was like, mm, I don't think you can fit in that role, you know, like we just had to fill the role. And so anyway, that's a long story to say, I did this, I, did, I performed on that, and I remember making an adult laugh whose name was Judge, you know? And I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. And then I just didn't know how to do that. You know, I just, I, I didn't know how to continue doing that. And so then it took me till I was like 28, basically, to start doing stand-up. And to make this quick, is that I, I think the storytelling part of comedy that I sort of jumped in and out of a little bit um, happened just simply because that's what was going on in Chicago at the time that I started doing stand-up. Like, there were a lot of people doing stand-up, but they were telling stories. Like, people were also doing the classic set-up punchline stuff, but it was also, that that's just where it had moved. And I'm very grateful for that because I feel like, um, I mean, I love doing both. I love being able to do both because getting people on board for, like, a five-minute story and then having it pay off is just, like, one of the most incredible feelings. And you should try it. I highly recommend it. I'm sure there's a room in the ship where people are doing it right now. Give it a shot. Um, I'm almost out of my prepared questions, but I'm hoping this is a good one. Uh, all of us on the stage, I believe, to varying degrees, have both created content for ourselves, whether it's a, I mean, or a, I thought you were going to say mental on this. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe um, But created content, content sort of as our own boss, so to speak, whether for contact, uh, con ooh, podcasts that we run, or being a stand-up, or what have you, and then have also worked for others, content creation-wise, whether in a writer's room, or as in journalism, or comedy academia, I don't know. Um, it's all comedy academia. Yes, it does. Uh, looking at those two experiences, do you find they're generally similar skill sets for you, or is one preferable to the other? Uh, are you are you better at one or enjoy one versus the other? Like I, you know, everyone always likes to think, oh, it's great to be your own boss and just be funny. I'll admit, I kind of love an external deadline. Uh, Storm and I have written for Mr. Science Theater the like, last three seasons, the, the rebooted season, and thank you. It's I mean, it's wonderful to like write an album and put it out, and here's the stuff I made. It's also kind of Free, oddly freeing in a way for to have this external source saying, you need to write a song that does this for this sketch. Now go do that job. Uh, and I, you know, personally, I kind of, you know, I love a, a deadline or some, some rules that I have to stay within. It gives me a, a starting rate uh, that I don't always give myself very easily. But I'm, I'm curious if anyone has any preferences or experiences regarding the, the contrast between those two types of, of writing and creating. Uh, well, I mean, I, I really enjoy both, and it, it, I think it took me, I, I've had the um, blessing to have a couple of writing jobs, almost completely for things that no one has seen. 
But it's, it was still like a great experience and uh, similar to the deadline, I feel like it, it allows for my own work to be more sustainable uh, because it provides for me financially to do that. But it also, there's other people involved, you know, like uh, which makes me work my creativity or, or open my creativity up to a new set of circumstances that I otherwise would probably never consider. You know, and I really enjoy like the collaborative aspect of being in a room. Um, and uh, <laughs> like I had to realize like, oh, I don't have to come up with everything. <laughs> you know, like, which, cause like when you're doing stand up, it's like you, I have to write an hour and it's nobody else is gonna do it for me. Um, but having the experience of like watching something get built by multiple brains and hearts and experiences is just, it's really powerful, and I, it's a, it's one of the things that I'm, I'm most grateful for in writing jobs. But I, I also like the experience of going out and experiencing the world and putting that together on my own, and then seeing if other people like it. And I have the blessing that like at least enough people continue to like my thoughts on the world. <laughs> I feel almost exactly the same. I like I love doing stand-up so much. It was like my entry all the other kinds of comedy. And I think sometimes people go, oh, you have these writing jobs, are you going to stop doing stand-up? And I think if I was going to stop, I would have stopped by now. Mm -hmm. uh, like the, the pandemic provided like a pretty nice out, a uh, pretty nice off-ramp if I wanted to quit. But I, there, the compulsion is within me to continue doing it. But it is really this balance of like, it's so nice. Um, Jennifer and her TV writers room panel was talking about how it's nice to have like and art form that you do when you're a creative person that is not what you do for a living. And I feel like really lucky that I get to do stand-up in a way that is sustainable, that it's not just a hobby, and it, it, you know, it, it is, I do it professionally, but it's so nice to, to get to do it exactly the way I want, because I'm not like, oh, I have to get more famous or else I can't afford my dog's prescription dog food. <laughs> So it's nice, and it's, and it's so wonderful other than the other thing to like participate in this big thing. And I, I wrote for last week's night with John Oliver for a number of years, and like one more wrinkle, one more wrinkle to that, and it is nice to write a super mean joke that someone else says on TV. <laughs> so that you're not going to be sued by a coal baron. Someone else is going to yell at this stock photo up to their Yeah. Head. Sometimes this is stuff. Oh, the Trojans are the meanest. <laughs> They'd be like, hey, we need some guy to look sad because someone fucked his wedding cake. <laughs> Josh, you look pathetic and like you let someone take advantage of the cake. And I'd be like, ooh. <laughs> I like them. Very convincing shots. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of an actor. Ask me. <laughs>
uh, but also I resent them. So <laughs> it's, been, it's kind of like a fun back and forth to have both going at the same time. Um, yeah, and I, I agree with everything you both are saying. I want to add in that to me there's a very important difference between working with someone or as part of a team in the capacity that you have a boss or you have an editor who has to accept or reject a pitch. Um, and and working with colleagues as opposed to working alone. And I think something I talked about on the panel we did yesterday on podcasting was that when I started doing your own about, I had this incredible backlog of stories that to me were clearly fascinating and with every editor I picked up to as a journalist was like, no, no one cares. No one wants to revisit a new picture unless you can go bother a new picture. Um, and then doing a podcast where I was in charge of what got done as a topic and was able to suggest that something might be interesting and then have that be confirmed by an audience. Like that was something that I would have been able, ever been able to do in that kind of public hierarchy. But then working now with Carolyn as the show's producer, Carolyn Hendrick, who also was on the panel yesterday, like I love that relationship in a and to me it's very different than working with an editor who says uh, yes or no based on how many clicks we're going to be on this topic because she kind of, I, we, me and my guests can through the files and we usually talk for two or three hours and just to cut it down to one and get us down as prepared as possible and also decide what's funny. And I love not having to decide what of what I said was the useful part of it. That's not my job. <laughs> What I say is none of my business. <laughs> That's your problem. But I do, I do also think that there's something kind of nice about working in a in a room and like obliterating your own ego and just like being like, oh, I know this is good, and then it's not right for the thing, and you go, okay, I'm not going to fight for it. I hear that no, and I'm going to because it doesn't serve the greater purpose or like the person in charge. Uh, we prefer to go a different direction with something, and I think that is such a useful skill, both for bolstering your stand-up to be like, I okay, I'm going to edit myself more rigorously because I know I can beat this, or knowing when you're going to give yourself a permission to be like a, the, the permission to be like a full-on ego monster and be like, yeah, I know this isn't the audience's favorite part of the set, but it is mine, so I can make them listen to it. <laughs> James Cameron's quotes about the new Avatar were so spectacular. Like it was so long, right? He was, someone asked him, like, "What about people who leave to pee?" And then he'll, he goes, "They'll catch up on what they missed when they come to see it a second time." <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, "Holy shit!" He also, he also said that the only uh, way to get his attention on set is with his pays so much more attention to the cartoon wolf that's on his cast. Because his eyes are always coming out of town yeah. on the carpet. <laughs> Just fear to know and learn from it. <laughs> um, who or what do you all find funny these days? And why? I'll start. <laughs> Uh, I really, I can't just constantly, the, the latest season of the Kids in the Hall was kind of a miracle that it was as great as it was after such a long time off of them, I really enjoyed that. Uh, as a writer, George Saunders, while not strictly yuck yuck, ha ha funny, I mean, he's you know, got such weird John's takes on everything I love. And most recently, uh, there's a British series called Extraordinary that's streaming in the US on Hulu that I have been proselytizing to everyone I know. It's just a wonderful show. The, the premise being, everyone in the world gets a superpower when they turn 18, except for this one protagonist who's this like 20, 25 year old to fuck up young woman in London and her gang of shaggy friends. Uh, I really sold it, didn't I? <laughs> but it's wonderful, watch it, damn it. Um. I I am so bad consuming new media. This came up last night because we were having I was having dinner with, with Josh and whatever and some people and the topic was, what have you seen? Have you seen the same thing? And I was like, no, I've seen nothing. It also doesn't have to be media, it could just be a person. Like Paul Tom is the most innately funny human on the planet. I would argue with that. Yeah, 
Yeah, and um, I mean, there, like, I, I was asking Josh about this the other day. I feel like this is true for a lot of people because my brain is just like filled with ping pong balls that are like you know, said in just the right way that I have filed away and just like sort of hear randomly when I need them. So just like, I don't know, like a big favorite of mine is a very early episode of me where Gary was doing his like this running air for Selena and she's meeting people and a couple is coming towards them and he says, wife not his daughter, wife not daughter. <laughs> like if something is said in a way that's perfect to me, like I always cling on to it like a duel and love that thing forever. Um, and you know, I think Jamie like is so funny and says, and specifically in that way where like she will say things that are funny in a perfect way that stick that stick in your brain. There's a moment there's a moment in her Mrs. Joey Chestnut show that I quoted back to her again, she said, um, because I love it so much, because she's talking to an automated voice that says, can you keep a secret? And she says, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the third thing I find funny is Love Me, I'm Liberal by Phil Oaks. Never gets old. They did a parody version of it in Love Mike in High School. So it holds up. Go listen to it. Thanks, Sarah. And it's like, as, as one of the Three people that have ever seen like Joey Chestnut show. <laughs> um, I guess like I think, I think it's there's like in the same way you're saying like, things that just stick in my head forever. Um, I'm trying to think, like there's a YouTube channel that we won't watch together the other night in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Mike Snake on YouTube. We've got one Mike Snake. Head. Yeah. I love how everyone so far has mentioned something. That has gotten one applause. <laughs> is that a singular applause? <laughs> it is now. Niche culture, baby, we're here. I uh, highly recommend my site. He's so funny and not super loud, which is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, we've, we've watched a lot of Mike's Mike together. And I watched, I watched and rewatched Mike's Mike just to like feel normal and fall asleep. Uh, I love Staff Loves Flats. Staff Loves Flats. Oh, yeah. Hulu. Um, 
Which I liked a lot. I thought it was, you know, I love what we do in the shadows for similar reasons. No heart, but I loved Reboot because it had a heart. Because I felt like it had a heart in a way that uh, shows often don't think they can have anymore. Um, and I think, I liked it. It was, it's not like sappy. It's not, because if you watch the show, you'll find out why it's not sappy. Because that's like what it's based in. But I felt like it earned all of its moments and it um, depicted comedy writer groups pretty accurately yeah. and uh, pretty pretty funnily. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I would throw down, you know, that Paula Tompkins is just an innately funny human, and I will say that Josh helped me understand one of his jokes last night, <laughs> because on the menu there was a reference to girlfriend in a coma, um, <laughs> and it said, I know, I know, it's serious, and I was like, why do people do this? I don't understand, like, I know what it's from, and I can't put the two pieces together. And then Josh helped me under, it's just syllables, it's syllables, so it's a, it's a Morrissey haiku. So yes, we, and, yeah, and yes, we absolutely stole that form from all the time. Of course, of course, it's his thing. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to come on down to the mic if for any individual or group up here. While people are coming to the front, I will say, there are Paula Tompkinsisms that I just do in conversation, and then I'd be like, oh, I'm just hacking him in my regular life. <laughs> I do, ooh, I thought of a new thing. Here's a, here's a specific Paula Tompkins thing that made me laugh for at least half of a plane ride. Uh, I forget what special it is, but he's talking about his jobs and the jobs that he had leading up to comedy. Um, and in, in one of them, it was a retail job. And somebody told him, if you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. And he's like, I'm a human being, I'm not a horse. I can't lock my knees for eight hours. <laughs> Uh, please go ahead. Uh, first of all, sorry, Principal Spore, I'm a cheat. I have uh, two questions. Uh, uh, I know. Uh, <laughs> they best be good and quick. Go yeah, ahead. the first one actually is really quick, which is it's hard to track people down. Can I get a signature from all of you? Sure, sure. at the end of the thing. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, and then uh, my actual question here is. Um, Gold and silver. Is that a cover for the world's largest iPad? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's actually a cover for a Magic the Gathering uh, deck box. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so my actual question is that, so I, I've written a lot of stuff both for things like D&D, stories, comedy, whatever you know comes up. And a lot of the issue that I run into when I write and I see when a lot of other people write is they they run to the issue of feeling like they're not writing original things, that they're basically feeling like this joke has already been hashed out, I don't know how to necessarily go about this, how do I make this feel original? So what are your own sort of personal things that you go through to help you decide whether something is worth pursuing or whether you think that it's something that needs to be sort of put aside as like for, for comedy? Hmm, interesting question. Um, I mean, it's, it's simple, but first and foremost, like, even if a thing doesn't feel incredibly original, it's like, does it make, do I think it's funny? Like, and if, if I think it's funny, as long as it's not a direct ripoff of something, it can be as similar as you want, as far as I'm concerned. If you've got something that you're saying in it, um, however trivial or not, uh, I, I think something like that is worth pursuing. I, you know, I will, I will, Abandon any project if I just feel like it's you know, it's kind of not funny. But I will pursue anything even if I think it's a direct ripoff of something else. As long as I feel like it's funny and I have somewhere to go with it beyond just here's this. Remember this initial joke? Here it is again. As long as I'm moving somewhere past that, you don't, you know, you're going somewhere. You're advancing somewhere. I, I feel like too I've had the experience of uh, <laughs> like realizing that um, like nothing is original. It, like everything's been done and it's very freeing if you're just like oh I'm just gonna I'm actually just gonna do what I want because um, I think it's funny um, and like Paul's saying unless you're not unless it, you have to actively be like oh I'm going to take that joke I just heard and put it in a thing otherwise like yeah somebody probably already did it uh, but you haven't done it before so that's like the important thing to really hang on to you know it's like I don't know as soon as you put stuff out in the world people are going to tell you what they don't like about it so you might as well enjoy it while you're making it <laughs> Might as well have a good time. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, my, my answer is similar because I have, you know, for the most part, I cast out my material like sitting alone on my living room floor talking to someone on a Zoom call. Um, and if I can make myself laugh, then I'm very happy with that. And then, because I, I get 
yeah, I mean, really, like, if it doesn't feel, like, nothing is original, so if it doesn't feel alive to you, then, like, that, to me, is a big reason. Yeah, I feel like it's, I don't know, but I, I am better at saying this than I am at actually executing it, but it's like, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and then you fail at something, and you learn one way to not do it again, and it's, like, the great thing about comedy is it's, like, you know, Personally, it's a nice stage, but no one's going to die if something you do isn't awesome right away. And it's like then you've learned one way to not do what you're trying to do. And um, most people like are going to give you another shot. And like it's, I don't know, yeah, I'm very pro uh, trying something and it doesn't work, then whatever. You know, it's like keep it pushing and do something that, that works a little better. So. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you very much. Thanks a Um, what do you think is the main difference between being funny spontaneously in front of friends and relations and being funny on purpose in front of strangers? And is there a way to channel one into the other? Uh, only, only perform theater shows in front of a large collection of your family and friends. <laughs> I think so much of it is about context, right? Like, it's about, about eliminating the like specter of, I guess you had to be there for the work you're doing, and I think bringing people into your world. So I think that's like a really wonderful challenge is to be able to create the same kind of feeling and context that you can create when you're like riffing with people that you know for strangers, and to create that kind of like, to translate like your own vibe and your own point of view, and to find a way to do that with like your performance and your words, and, and uh, and it's, yeah, it's all, I think so much of it is just about creating that context for the audience. They go, oh, we see what you're doing there. And I would say that I fully agree with what Josh is saying. It's, it's a word that is very loaded, but I don't mean it the way that I feel like we often think about it, but it's confidence. You know, not like, oh, I'm so confident in myself, but it's like, I am so confident in this exact moment, because I think that is the thread between those two contexts. Because when you're with your friends or people that you love and trust and feel comfortable around, you're confident that they're going to receive you, you know? That they're not going to be like, get out of here and throw a tomato <laughs> in your face. <laughs> exactly. And so, like, if you can channel that, with, and it takes practice, it takes going up at open mics and not having confidence, and doing it a bunch of times and going, oh, I didn't die. Like, that wasn't the way I wanted it to go, but I didn't die. Like, okay. Maybe I can, you know, it, and it's still a little bit of that, like, pretending people are in their underwear. It's like pretending these people are your friends. You know, a lot of comics go at it as, like, the audience is an enemy. I much prefer to pretend that the audience is my best friends. They love me, and they're going to give me treats after this. You know, like, I need a little water, some cool like or something. So, like, it, it really is, like, developing the confidence in the material and in yourself and just pulling back from that um, at-home time, you know? It's so great how low our standards are as comedians where two people have gone in the last ten minutes gone, well you're not gonna die from it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's okay. uh, does like choreography matter to you? Like for, for like a, I don't know, I think I've had way more uh, luck and felt just way better uh, trying to forge like you were just saying or like forging a positive connection with the audience than coming in defensive. Because you wouldn't do that with your friends and family and yeah, it's like starting with, and if everyone turns again too hard, then I guess like, you know, take it out of the machine and see what happens. But like, <laughs> for the most part, I think your audience is going to be on your side, and it's like connecting with them the same way you want to connect with your friends. Thank you. Thank hey, you all. Um, I'm just curious, what makes something funny to you, whether it's stuff you create or stuff you consume? Yeah. Cool. Mm, nice easy question to answer. Yeah. Okay, well, I, the last thing that made me snort, I was reading a uh, biography of Nancy Reagan by the pool this morning. So I'm on vacation. Um, and I was reading a paragraph where uh, Frank Sinatra called Nancy Reagan a joke with Fat Angles who could never make it as an actress. Um, and I have Fat Angles. Who are working? 
And then the next paragraph starts with like, Shelly Green says, and that's really funny because it's a presidential biography where one of the major sources is Shelly Green. Um, so I guess, I don't know, I think that like, history is a laugh riot and like the things that happen in history are consistently very funny to me and that might be my main source of material because you just read a sentence that's straightforward and describing something that happened in history. And it's very funny because I think that like when something is happening around us, it's harder for most of us to kind of strip it back to the human motivations and the realities. And then like the reasons that people do the things they do or think they're doing the things they do are very funny. <laughs> Anyone else uh, think? I gosh, I'm so I'm so such a simple laugher. I like, I just love when something is so much dumber than you'd expect. Yeah. <laughs> like, just the dumb, like, the not obvious, but dumber than obvious. So is that dumb is more, right. more obvious than obvious, uh, to paraphrase the Tyrell version. Um, but my, what, like, example, my, my wife, Maris, Christ, who spoke on our panel here, on our panel here earlier this week, so wonderful, so funny. We were driving through the Bronx to our home in Brooklyn, and there was, this was a couple years ago, and there was a billboard for the movie Ad Astra, where Brad Pitt is in space, and we said, Maris pointed at the billboard and goes, Ad Astra, you know that's short for sad astronaut? And it made me laugh so hard, and I laugh every time I think about it, or anyone brings up that movie, and it's like such a dumb joke, and I'm like, yeah, that's right where my heart is, always. I love, I love body horror, Once, if that wears out, you know, once you're like, that part isn't even doing it for me, like, 
yeah, what a great what a great moment to be like, okay, I can just literally put this on a shelf and then make new new space for new stuff. Because if you keep telling the old ones, you will never write new ones. <laughs> like so it's actually like a great, you know, um, like tilling of the soil to be like, oh I can't I don't want to do that anymore. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Aside from Paula Tompkins, because we've established that, <laughs> who's the funniest person you know, and what have you pilfered from them? Um, I mean, I can answer that very, uh, very quickly, and that is uh, my partner Mary Lee Rubin, uh, who wrote, literally wrote a joke. For, I started doing a joke, um, and it is. I am completely blanking on what the joke is, uh, but I, I refer to her as a a, a Carhartt day. And uh, I was like, yeah, I say, oh, I remember what it is. She, she upgraded one of my jokes, which is I say, my girlfriend is a Carhartt day. And she was like, you should say that I'm your boyfriend. And I was like, you're absolutely right. My boyfriend is a Carhartt day. <laughs> but she is the funniest person that I know. I'm not just being sweet. <laughs> Gosh, that's such a good question. And so you kind of, what have been answer that you didn't even go for just directly to the note? Just directly to the note. Like, I know, I know who's the boss here. <laughs> I mean, uh, not to pilfer your answer, but you know, I, I laugh more at things my wife says than anybody I know. And partly she's very funny, and partly we just have all this shared context. Like we get more delight out of doing stupid, dumb rhyming games. Like who can tell? Like you know, something, some word comes up, and who can just sort of riff on it with the dumbest, most sweaty rhyme for it, but worse. <laughs> And the least matching the better, but we just did that all that damn day and could, couldn't be happier. Um, I'm good friends with a two year old at the moment. <laughs> 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 like, no one's funnier than a father. And walking like early father jokes, like understanding that the joke muscle is there in the psyche from the start, is like, it's so exciting. It's like being in like the primordial soup of comedy. Um, Yeah, I think. Sense memory brings it back. 
um, I, I have a very gentle demeanor on stage, and so when people are being disruptive, if I immediately resort to like, fuck you, jump in a hole, people get, it's very off-putting, and so one thing that really helps me deal with sub-optimal audience situations is to remember like, this is a person, I'm in a room full of people, I need to treat them like a person, with, with like a gentleness, but like also while doing that, like maintaining my confidence of like, I am in charge. Yeah. I, I, I have, uh, I don't know, I feel like when someone is giving me more time and the audience is generally like, they don't want that to happen. And so yeah, like, I don't like usually walk up to them and be like, tell me to hold your hands, <laughs> like, clear your needs and attention right now. Like, how can we get this out of your system? If you stop throwing a tantrum, I don't know what they get to do. And uh, then they're usually embarrassed and, and mortified, or they leave. And you're like, well, no, like, I don't know. Either, either way, problem solved. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Nice. So, we've already talked a little bit about being funny and figuring out if things are funny to you, but when you're alone, do you have a sense of funny to the rest of the thing, or do, do you have to, like, have another person? Be like, okay, yeah, this is funny to me too. Uh, if I'm understanding the question, just so to say, if, if I'm alone, like, how do you figure out something's really funny? Oh, here? Okay. Mm. Uh, Can you? <laughs> to, the, to a certain extent, I think. I mean, you, you just kind of set your own internal barometer for something. You never really will know until it's out in front of someone. But you can just, I mean, it's not a rocket science answer. But, you know, trust your instinct. Listen to and trust your instinct. And it's not always going to work, and try and readjust as you, you go along uh, to see which of your instincts suck or not. <laughs> I think it's always a bonus, you know, to have funny friends, and then and, or funny friends or people that you look up to that you you want to emulate or, or or be like. And if you get, it's it's simply a bonus that like on those jokes, like somebody like that is like, oh, I really love that, because then you know, like, okay, great, this person whose brain I want to share likes this joke. Otherwise, you're just like, I have to believe in this or not. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. I was wondering, Josh, and it might hit the others. Um, I hear you often on Wait, Wait, Get Tell Me, and on um, Love It, Leave It, and places like that. How do you switch from PBS voice to Love It, Leave It voice and keep your brain? Uh, First, you lean in closer to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good question. I mean, I, I really like switching gears. I think I, I, overall, I really enjoy like working in different kinds of formats and for different kinds of voices. And so I think each each of those uh, outlets, love it or leave it, they would come tell me, I do the bugle pretty regularly. And so it's all kind of a different flexing of similar muscles um, or, or a, you know cross training. And I like that rather than just doing the same, working in the same, Mode all the time. I, I think it like helps keep each individual thing fresh and something I can look forward to. Yeah. Um, and so I like try to find the things that like, ooh, on um, love it or leave it, I get to like be a little saltier. And on wait, wait, I can like be a little sillier and a little more twee and wordplay and stuff. Uh, and, and so figuring out what to like really dig in and enjoy about each outlet is like a really special fun challenge. Thank you very much, everyone. This panel has been brought to you by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur <laughs> Foundation. Here's a couple of more guests in the world. Thank you.